was a childhood dream of mine to join the Marine Corps. I came from uh, the World War II generation where my uncle served in the military, my father served in the military. You're gonna do it right, do you hear me? Yeah! What kind of clinched it for me, my dad took me to the movies and we saw the movie The D.I. with Jack Webb. The D.I. stands for the drill instructor and when I saw the, the film, I said something like, that's for me. And I was probably six years old at the time. So when I got out of high school in June of 67, I was signed up by May of 67. I was already signed up, ready to go. I was called by my recruiter and said, we're gonna have to terminate your 120 day program because we need you now. He says, report to Fort Hamilton tomorrow, 0800 hours. First comes boot camp, then infantry training, jump school, recon school. Then after several months, I was deployed. The first stop was Okinawa. As we fed the troops, as they would come through there, and they wore their dress uniforms there, every one of them had a purple heart on. And I remember telling the guy that was next to me, as we're scooping the eggs out or whatever we're scooping, I said, we're not getting out of Nam without getting hit. This is impossible. Look at these guys. Every one of them's got a purple heart. And when you're in a rifle company or a crunch type unit, it's pretty tough to get through without getting hurt. When you get into Da Nang and the airport area, all confusion. A truck is outside and they'll scream out your names or who's going to first recon. Get on these vehicles and off we went. Driving down the road and of course your eyes are wide open, you're looking at the new sights. Vietnam is a very beautiful country. It's lush, it's green. And of course you'd see the hills pockmarked with bomb craters to let you know that there was a conflict going on. Of course, there's an extreme military presence. There's jets, fighter planes flying overhead, helicopters all over the, you know, you hear the noise, helicopters. The sights, the sounds, the smells, you know, it's like being in farm country, there's rice paddies all over the place. The mind is going and the eyes are wide open. And we went to the battalion headquarters and some sergeant came out there and, and he just went like, pointed his finger, you two go to Alpha, you two go to Bravo, you two go to Delta. And the platoon sergeant would get you your gear and you're on the team. I went on my, we, we call my first and last real patrol. And we went out into the hills and the mountains. We patrolled for five days, you know, looking for enemy soldiers. That was, that was our job. We're definitely in a hostile territory. Nothing is safe over there. You fall asleep on guard duty, you're gonna have your throat slit. That's what I would be taught in boot camp. And now I'm out there in the middle of nowhere, and at night you can see trace surrounds off in the hilltops. You can hear muffled explosions in the valleys. So I would be out there at guard duty, and I was scared. I was, uh, you know, everything looked like it was moving. And on the fifth day, we received mortar fire. The mortars landed right in the middle of our position. And the third or fourth one that came in wounded me and killed another man. The tremendous explosion blew me up in the air and they knew my leg was hit because it felt extreme pain coming from my thigh. And I couldn't see too good because I had sand and dirt in my eyes. And then when my vision returned a little bit better, I could see the hole where the round landed. There was smoke coming out of it. I saw the one fellow laying on the ground, and I just knew he was dead. And I started crawling because I uh, wanted to get out of the way of the barrage. I called out for the corpsman. Two guys came out and grabbed me by my shoulders with a haversack straps and uh, dragged me behind some rocks. And I just faded in and out of consciousness. I could see the guys shooting. I couldn't hear because my ears were ringing. And I was asking everybody to get me out of here. You know, as they walked past, I grabbed their pants and get me out of here, get me out of here. And I go, we're getting you out of here, don't worry about it. And the leg was still attached to me. Uh, it was definitely severely injured because I naturally you check yourself out. And when I put my right hand on my thigh, which is where the pain was coming from, my hand went right into the whole leg. At that time I called for the corpsman and I said it blew my legs off. And then he said, no, they didn't. And I sat back up again. I checked myself out. My, head, my pants were completely blown off. And that's, that's the time they grabbed me and started dragging me. Eventually a helicopter came and they put me on and uh, I woke up in China Beach Hospital. I was in Da Nang. I mean, I was taking my clothes off. When I got back to the, the hospital, I was like in a panic mode when I woke up. 
And I think the light of the operating table is what woke me up, because it was very bright. And it was surrounded by medical people, doctors, corpsmen, nurses. They were asking me all, prompting me with questions. Where you from, where this and that. And I thought I was captured, because they kept on asking me my service number. And they reiterated that, no, you're in China Beach Hospital, Danang, you're okay. Anesthetization took place and I was out. Woke up the next day, picked the sheets up, saw one leg gone, the other one go bandaged up. And it just said, like at the time, so it's one gone, still got one. I asked if I was gonna die, they said no. I said, you're gonna cut this leg off? They said no. So they were 50% right, they did cut the leg off and I did live. And that's when my new life started. <laughs> I spent 13 months in the hospital. I felt really down that I, this happened to me. I didn't want it to happen. I kind of blamed myself, and I was not a happy camper, to say the least. I considered myself tip-top physical shape. I was a varsity athlete in a couple of different sports, and now I'm like I'm back to baby 101. I gotta have someone uh, powder my butt. Now I'm in traction, bedpan. IVs in both arms, the catheter in my penis, or whatever. It was four months of that, and it was extremely painful, very lonely, very scared into what the future was gonna be. I didn't see any relief in sight, and everybody would be encouraging, you'll do this, you'll do that. My entire leg was gone. My leg was amputated at the hip. Later found out my shin was broken, my toes were amputated. I had a chunk out of my thigh and a chunk out of my calf, and you just lay there in bed can't get up, can't get out of bed, you have no place to go, and you're just waiting to heal, and it takes a long time. And it never dawned on me the anguish that my mother and father and my sister were going through in addition to my aunts and uncles. And I did get a phone call, one phone call to Japan, and they told me it was your mother, and I couldn't believe this, but my mother was a woman that was full of energy. And if anyone could call Japan and get their son on the phone, it would be her. This is not the high-tech days that we have now. This is 1968, and it was miraculous. When I found out I got the phone call, I wasn't too happy about it because I had to get out of bed to answer the phone. Actually, it was probably the first time I got out of bed, and I, was, I didn't want, I had to sit in a wheelchair, and I was in extreme pain. They had to take me out of the traction, put me on a bed, and I went over to that phone, and I remember my mother saying, like, I'm in a wheelchair. She was ecstatic that I was in a wheelchair. <gasps> oh, he's in a wheelchair, like he can get around, you know. Little did I know, but one of our friends that in the neighborhood was a phone company employee, hooked up my mother's phone to have it on a speakerphone. All my relatives were probably in my mother's living room, holding their breath, listening to me talk to my mother. Now, I never knew it. I just thought it was me talking to mom, which was no problem, because I was telling my mother, I'm feeling okay, don't worry, I'll be all right. Then my uncle Joe, my mom's brother, got on the phone, who was in the Marines. I started talking to him like Marine to Marine, you know, and I was letting loose with the profanity. And I was telling him, Uncle Joe, I am really screwed up. I didn't know it, but everyone was hearing this stuff. You know, so all the comfort that I tried to give my mother, like, hey, there's no big deal. And I'm going, the fucking pain is unbelievable. You know, like this, you like being tortured in this goddamn place. You know, and so my mother heard that, and everyone else heard it too. First time I came home uh, was Labor Day weekend of 1968. The moment when I first saw my mother and father was happy and sad. I was happy to see them, but I didn't like what they were seeing. I felt embarrassed. My entire leg was gone. My other leg was all bandaged up. And I felt so bad that their, you know, in their eyes, their young, beautiful boy, you know, was, was banged up so bad. I thought it was gonna be a nice little quiet time in the house. I was looking forward to some of my mother's good cooking. My father was like so happy to have me home that he invited the neighbors to come over and say hello. It was awkward for me. I was wearing shorts and I had a cast on my leg all the way down to my foot to my hip. The other leg was gone. As a kid, they called me JJ and he's saying, JJ's home, come on in, come on in and see him. I'm going, no, get him out of here. I don't want, you don't want anybody looking at me. I don't even want anybody seeing me, you know? He's bringing the neighbor's kids over there, like seven and nine years old. I'm like, Dad, please stop this. I, I, I don't want this. It, like rain people all weekend long. And I just couldn't wait to get back into the uh, hospital. 
was during that weekend, there was a lot of drinking going on. And people would come over to me and they would be drunk and they would be saying like, you're gonna do great, you're gonna do fine, I know. And I'm going, Jesus Christ, let me get out of here. I can't stand this. And my mother came in and she started crying. I didn't know what the heck I'm gonna do. I didn't know how I'm gonna do it. I didn't know what a wooden leg looked like at the time. I said, Mom, I will figure this thing out. And don't worry about it. And I did. The last thing I want is my parents to have pain and suffering. They were in pain and they definitely were suffering. My goal was to make them feel comfortable that they would not have to worry about me. And I didn't want them to feel bad that I'm some kind of cripple or something like that. And I sat my mom down and told her there'll be no more tears. And uh, we lived to our agreement, there'll be no more tears. And the only tears from that point on were tears of joy. Rehabilitation was halted because of my broken shin. And it took months for the shin to recover. And the big day was when you get the artificial leg. Little did I know at the time that very few hip disarticulations, amputees, which is what I am, wear the prosthesis. Very few, because it's uncomfortable. So there's very few successful hip prosthetic wearers out there. I didn't know that. You know, I, no one told it to me, and maybe if they did, I don't think it would have made any difference. But there was this ugly, prehistoric looking monstrosity. Uh, and I go, that's the leg? And I go, this is the leg. We're gonna fix it up, we're gonna shave, it's wood. It's, you know, I mean, it's the wooden leg. We're gonna fine tune it, we're gonna sand it down and take all these things out and it'll look good. It didn't look good to me at all. It just looked too big, because it comes around your hip and it straps around and I was depressed. And I believe it was that day that I actually put it on, strapped it on me and I actually stood up for the first time. And I can actually say it on that day, on the, in between the parallel bars, I took, uh, you know, a step or two. But I felt good that at least I looked like I had two limbs now. If I'm sitting down, I'd fake people out. They would never know I was an amputee. In time, I was walking with just a cane going down the hallway. And I remember somebody coming up, he says, I can't believe you. You know, it was another patient. He said, you just got that damn thing. And you were walking with a cane. I can't tell you how determined I was. It was such a, a focus that this was going to happen, no ifs, ands, or buts. And this was my mark. I was going to learn how to walk with a hip disarticulation prosthesis. And I'm proud to say, I don't know too many people that can do it better than me. And I'll right now put the challenge out there, <laughs> even though my ankle is killing me. You know, I mean, uh, I've done things with this leg that I could not believe. The leg was wood back in the old days. And when a little child comes running up to you, you want to be careful that they don't smack into you it's like a piece of furniture in a sense, you know. We always refer to it as the hard leg. Watch out for daddy's hard leg. You don't want to bang your hand on it. My oldest daughter, Kimberly, uh, wrote like a term paper in uh, preschool and had to draw a picture of their father, whatever case, and she drew a picture of me uh, either without the leg or depicting a prosthetic leg. My father has a hard leg, which prompted the teacher to call up and find out what's going on, <laughs> you know, something like that. Kids never had a problem with it, you know, from day one. And they've enjoyed my success, there's no doubt about it. And hey, and it probably makes it hard for them. They can't be human because they have this like Superman for a father, you know? <laughs> you know, because they, they hear no excuses. The guys in the bowling alley would come up to me and go, oh, my knee is killing me. I go, don't go there, man. I don't want to hear no leg excuses. <laughs> It's almost like a storybook ending. It was a wonderful experience, and I'm so happy that my children, you know, were there with me when I, and my wife, when I got the award, because I know they were just as proud of it as I was. I was involved in so many different other things that nobody would think that I was disabled. And I don't think I'm disabled. <laughs> I, to this day, I don't think I'm disabled.
There's no doubt in my mind that the proudest thing that I have accomplished in my life is raising these two kids. I have two beautiful young ladies. They're bright, they're good. The whole neighborhood loves them. They're the two most sought after babysitters throughout the history of Massapequa. <laughs> I give up everything else. That's the best thing I've done in my life. It took a while, but it's been a very joyful experience. And I've had a lot of wonderful moments with my mom and dad, with my wife, with my kids, uh, what I wouldn't trade for anything. Nice.